Okay, thank you very much. So I'd first of all like to uh, introduce the team. So Catherine is coming, but I don't see her yet. I'm going to introduce people in maybe a slightly different way than usual um, and tell you a little bit about their disciplinary backgrounds and where they've worked in the system, which will give you a sense of the breadth of the team. Catherine um, trained initially as a nurse and then um, did occupational hygiene. She worked initially at St. Michael's Hospital as the corporate hygienist then moved to what was OSACH and PSHSA, so has had experience working in an HSA. Um, while she was there, was seconded um, and worked with the, um, the dean group and also the Ministry of Labor in the transition role, so has had experience kind of in the Ministry of Labor context and is now at University Health Network. Irina Kudla, who is across the table, uh, is an occupational hygienist, and Irina uh, spent her first 12 years um, at OCAL and has been for now almost 12 years uh, at St. Mike's in our occupational health clinic as our clinical occupational hygienist. And Janet Brown, who uh, does change management, and Janet has worked um, in a number of institutions, healthcare institutions, but more importantly for this, has worked actually um, with all of the Crees. Um, so is again well embedded in the system and uh, knows us all pretty well. Um, so with that, uh, I'll get started. And I'm going to very briefly um, go over a few points around occupational disease, uh, spend the majority of the time talking about the study we did of health and safety association consultants, and then just touch on ongoing work um, as a result of that study. So when we talk about occupational disease, as most of you know, within the health and safety system, there are two research centers focused on occupational disease, the Occupational Cancer Research Center, which obviously deals with cancers, and then CREOD, which deals with the non-malignant occupational disease. Um, and so if we're thinking about occupational disease, um, the things we tend to focus on are chemical exposures, physical agents like noise, vibration, UV, and the host of biological agents. So one of the challenges with occupational disease is there are hundreds of exposures. And so it's kind of very hard to kind of really categorize them as one or two key things because there are many, many of them. So I think that's one of the challenges when we are trying to deal with occupational disease. The other thing I just wanted to say is that Exposures can cause disease at the site of contact. So for instance, if you have a chemical exposure, it can cause dermatitis on the skin where you have contact with it. Or if you inhale it, it can cause a response in the lung like asthma. But the other important thing is a number of those chemical exposures and other exposures can actually be absorbed systemically and can cause disease at distant sites. So we're talking not just about kind of the body surfaces, but we're talking potentially about disease in every organ system. So that's another complicating factor. So if you're trying to think about occupational disease, the reality is, again, there are hundreds of occupational diseases to think about. And these are just um, kind of represent the diseases which CREOD focuses on. Um, this is a person with allergic contact dermatitis of the skin. Uh, an audiogram demonstrating the typical uh, audiometric changes of noise and just hearing loss. This is a worker with occupational asthma being challenged with uh, toluene disocyanate, and you can see the, the drops in their airflow. And then this is an individual with hand arm vibration syndrome, and you can see the very dramatic blanching of their fingers as a result of that vibration exposure. Another important thing about occupational disease is that for many of the diseases, the earlier you make the definitive diagnosis and intervene not only with medical treatment, but also with, if you like, treatment of the workplace, the better the outcome. So early recognition and diagnosis is really important to affect good outcomes. So a question that's really important is how common is occupational disease? And I'm going to use this one example to demonstrate the problem we have in really understanding how prevalent a variety of occupational diseases are. So the first information comes from the WSIB. These are disease claims for a five-year period from 2008 to 2012, representing healthcare, education, municipal, and Schedule II. So all of those sectors. In total, there were just over 3,800 disease claims. That's disease claims in total, of which 1,000 were dermatitis. So that's over a five-year period. In those sectors, there were a 1,000 dermatitis claims from the WSIB's perspective. 
There have been several large recent studies of healthcare workers in Europe and Southeast Asia. The one-year prevalence in those studies is consistently between 20 and 25 percent. So you can see there's a bit of discrepancy there. And most recently, a year ago, um, we conducted a study in a healthcare institution in Ontario. 51% of the workers we saw had mild skin changes, 13% had moderate to severe changes. So I think from that hopefully simple example, you can see there is a significant difference between the, how common you think these would be if you were using WSIB statistics versus if you actually go out to the workplace and actually see workers, talk to workers, examine workers, you see a lot more disease. So it means that the statistics we commonly use are basically um, really, who knows what they mean, but they certainly don't necessarily represent uh, the burden of disease. So there's a real problem in making the link. Occupational disease is under-recognized, under-reported, and there are a number of reasons for this general lack of awareness about the exposures and the diseases, the continuing challenge we have around healthcare providers not taking a work history and therefore not making the link, the challenge with uh, claim statistics suggesting that really occupational disease isn't a problem. So the solution simplistically might be increased awareness, better prevention, and improved recognition. So the research centers, CREMSD and CREOD, were launched in 2004, and we at that time had four areas of focus, skin, lung, noise and vibration, and biological agents, so it maps to some of the examples I gave before. And over that 10-year period, we have really strongly engaged and increasingly engaged with the health and safety system. We've done that through our advisory committee, which has membership from a variety of groups within the system. We've had regular consultation sessions, and also through a number of research pilots and projects. Um, one that we did with the services sector um, looked at occupational skin disease in the service sector and clearly demonstrated there was low awareness and really a lack of attention to prevention. I will get this right eventually. So when we've talked to the various workplace parties and stakeholders, Everybody recognizes that awareness of occupational disease and the hazards are low. Also, there's really been very little focus on occupational disease at the system level. The focus tends to be on accidents, um, a bit more on musculoskeletal problems, but generally speaking, there is not a lot of focus on occupational disease. Um, so we need to focus on working with frontline staff, and we have to be quite sensitive about this current health and safety system in the province. So we completed a study funded by the WSIB RAC, which had two purposes. First of all, to identify and assess gaps in awareness, knowledge, and skills and resources of the Health and Safety Association consultants and explore potential barriers to them implementing occupational disease awareness and prevention activities and from that information to inform the development of education programs and tools to bring knowledge to the point of practice. The study focused on occupational disease generally and occupational skin disease specifically. As I present the study, I'm going to just use the term occupational disease, but you can take it that the findings related to disease broadly equally apply to occupational skin disease. Can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. So one of the things that uh, we wanted people to understand is that in the lead up, there was quite a, this consultation that Lynn talked about that led up to the creation of this study. The strong advice we were getting from our folks in the system, but particularly from our advisory committee, was that we needed to focus our attention on the front line folks in the system. So uh, inspectors at the Ministry of Labor, the health and safety consultants, uh, health and safety reps in the labor and um, employer side. And what was agreed was a pl the best place to start was with HSA consultants. So the intent from the very beginning had been that this would be the first, the first wave of work to look at what the needs and resources might be uh, at, at the front of the system versus working at the very high level of the system. Okay. Good. Yeah. So the study had two components. The initial component was really a needs assessment, which was done through eight focus groups um, with 64 participants from the four health and safety associations that are sector-based. So we basically did two focus groups with each of the four. 
Each of the participants completed a short survey before the focus group just to give us some demographic information. We gathered all the focus group information together, analyzed it, and then held a workshop to which we invited 20 of the system partners, so again, Ministry of Labor, WSIB, the Health and Safety Associations, unions, employers, um, other research groups, to kind of listen to the results and again provide feedback and commentary. So to really kind of say, yes, well, that, sounds, that sounds right, mm, this is interesting, maybe we should think about this. So these are the survey results, so these are the characteristics of the 64 um, consultants that we um, took part in the focus groups. So 77% of them at the time of the focus groups consult now across multiple sectors. Um, three quarters of them had more than at least 10 to 15 years experience in the health and safety system, so they're generally an experienced group. Again, almost three quarters had had formal health and safety training. About two thirds identified clients having issues with both occupational disease and occupational skin disease. But when they said, do you think that your clients are really aware that their employees are at risk of these things, only a third thought that their um, clients had awareness. So I'm going to now share the results and what I'll do is I'll give you a bit of information I'll, and then I'll just stop and if you have any comments or questions and then we'll just kind of work through it. So first of all, we had a conversation about the consultants, about their experiences as consultants, about uh, the visits they make to their clients. So they generally speaking, and, and remember these are the results overall, so within that group of 64, and there will be a bit of variation, so um, some, may, some may not exactly fit the description we're giving you, but this is, as I say, the general uh, kind of majority view. So most of the consultants view themselves as generalists. They kind of had to deal with everything across the system. And they felt that that role had changed, that as the system had changed, as the 12 HSAs had become four, um, that previously they had been more specialized, they might have been assigned to a very specific sector, um, and so now they were having to be much more general in their approach, meaning they needed to need more and deal with a lot um, of variation. They also noted that historically their work was much more reactive that, um, and so if you remember um, the program where the Ministry of Labor with the WSIB identified poor performing mm -hmm. firms and the HSAs went out and visited a set of those firms, so they were really reacting to kind of hear problems in the system, kind of go out and deal with those. And they felt that that shift was actually changing a bit and there was now um, much more proactive visiting uh, with a focus on prevention. If they were going out to visit clients, um, the key reasons for going out were either addressing a problem the client had come to them about, assessing a client's program, a site visit, or actually selling the Health and Safety Association products, i.e. educational and training programs. And the other thing that is very consistent is they said the employers, and themselves in fact, were very much driven by the Ministry of Labor's high hazard list. So slips, trips and falls, falls from heights, those are the things that they were focused on, those are the things that their clients were focused on, i.e. Hawk disease wasn't a focus. When we said specifically, do you make visits around occupational disease, the answer was not very often. It was usually reactive, so one of the firms had either had a WSIB claim and were struggling with the claim, they had a visit from the Ministry of Labor and the ministry had suggested they talk to their health and safety association because they'd received orders, or they'd had a problem with, with an employee that hadn't actually reached a WSIB claim. The education they provided to their clients was both informal, so they took products with them, they had some fact sheets which they might deliver. Um, they might deliver kind of an informal tailgate type of, um, you know, five to ten minute teaching session, giving safety talks. And formally, obviously, the HSAs provide certification training and other uh, very formal training in classrooms or areas. Yes? This is visits that relate to OD? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And when they focused on hazards and controls, they tended to use a risk assessment or a hierarchy of controls kind of frame to do that. If there was a disease problem, they said, oh, we, don't, we don't give them any advice, we just tell them, tell the worker to go see their doctor. 
So they were very much on the prevention side of the thing, kind of here are the exposures, here's how you might do the controls. Once it started to move into the person sick, it was basically go see your doctor. And the other thing they said was they felt that in interacting with their clients, it was really important to keep things simple. So like not, not provide, you know, kind of reams and reams of information with a tremendous amount of detail, but to keep things simple, straightforward, kind of easy to understand and manage. Client characteristics, obviously a range of sectors covered. The mix from very, very small firms to very large firms means firms with no resources to firms that are incredibly sophisticated in their health and safety resources, unionized, non-unionized, subcontractors, one site, many sites, office plus sites, sites that actually move around. So bottom line, tremendous variation in the clients they serve. And equally, huge variation in the workers that work at those clients. So those that are literally on their first day of the job to those that are tremendously experienced. There's the mobile group, the underground economy, different levels of education and training of the workers, um, the challenge of language. And then the problem, again, is that as you think about these individuals are sectorized, that some workers who actually, say, are working in one sector, but actually do work of another sector. So they gave the example, there's construction work going on in the manufacturing facility. So even though I'm going to the manufacturing facility, their problems right now are actually more deal with kind of a construction problem. So bottom line, um, the workshop, when we took this back to the partners, big challenge. Diverse needs of the client firms, of the workers, that client mix has changed as the system has moved from the 12 to the 4. So they now have challenges of dealing with a much broader group of sectors. Some of them were assigning by postal codes, not by sector. Um, so all of these things really strained the capacity of the frontline consultants who were out there trying to deliver services. And the view was that they needed to work together as a team to really address all the needs because they no longer really had experience and expertise. So let's say that they had worked in construction. So a frontline consultant might have a lot of experience around construction and what happens there. But now if they're suddenly covering off transportation, they don't really have much knowledge of transportation specifically. So they felt they really had to rely much more on their team. So hopefully somebody on their team would know something about transportation and be able to help them out. So there was a definite sense that kind of team was becoming more important to support them in their work. So I'm going to stop there. Any questions or comments? Or yes, Amelia. I'm just wondering, um, do they work with maybe suppliers of, of products? You know, like the manufacturers of tools and equipment that vibrate a lot in construction, yeah. or maybe in the hairdressing industry, people who provide the chemical products for dyes and stuff like that. Help work through those avenues of, of suppliers of some of these things that have adverse exposure. So I didn't get the sense that the frontline consultants particularly did that. They might, in a, in a, you know, if they were out in an individual workplace, might be dealing with something very specific. I think they would very much rely on the experts within the HSA. So um, some of the HSA still have, say, occupational hygienists, ergonomists, and they would tend to go to those individuals for kind of more sophisticated support. So I think that it would be probably not that common that the frontline consultant would actually be dealing a lot with, as you say, a supplier around, you know, kind of anti-vibration chainsaws or whatever. Yes, Bells. Um, when, uh, when the consultant uh, refers to a physician, do they mention OCAL? Uh, so, the, so they mentioned OCAL when it came to other resources. The physician, I don't think they were specific specific That's about. True. It was very much, oh, you've got a problem, go see your family doc, like go see your doctor. <coughs> so it, they weren't they weren't being sophisticated in the sense of go to a clinic that specialized around work related problems. It was basically you just know you need to go see the healthcare system. Okay. Yeah. Do any any comments back on how that healthcare system responded to these occupational diseases? Um, were they satisfied with that? So the, so we I, I, I don't have it. There's lots of details here, but I can yeah. answer your question. So it was interesting. So we did. T so one of the barriers is around the healthcare system, uh -huh. and the comments that were made um, were that um, often people didn't have a family physician, okay. and secondly, 
Um, and it's it tended to be, I think, particularly in the male-oriented groups. Even if they have a family doctor, they don't go and see them. So kind of that, that kind of routine visiting wasn't necessarily happening. So again, you have the challenge that the problem has to be problematic enough to the worker for them to actually kind of take the initiative to go see their doctor. And if they don't have a doctor, they've got to go to a walk-in clinic or emergency or whatever. So, um, And then there's the whole issue about the physicians not having a clue what to do with them anyway because they don't anything about work. So, yeah. So, I mean, so there's a big chunk around the healthcare system, as you can well imagine. Okay. So next we asked a series of questions around their knowledge, so their personal knowledge around occupational disease. And then we also probed um, their sense of the knowledge of their clients and also the resources they used. So again, as I say, there's variation across the consultants. And there was clear, some of them felt quite confident about occupational disease and others felt totally like, I really don't know anything. It really worries me. I hope nobody asks me about it. So wide variation in their sense of knowledge and their comfort in dealing with occupational disease issues. The other thing was, even when they had knowledge, they partitioned it. So they said, well, I, I know a fair bit about the exposures or I kind of know the kind of strategies around control, but I really don't know anything about disease. So there were kind of areas that they could they felt confident in talking to and others which they felt quite insecure about. So variation in knowledge generally and then variation in what they knew around the particular <coughs> exposure or disease. And the thing that came back, so here we have this recurring theme. The system is very focused on the high hazard issues and so I have to prioritize my time. So, you know, if, you know, am I going to go and learn about this disease, which I think I'm never going to see or be asked about, versus there's a session on slips, trips, and falls, and I know that we're focusing on slips, trips, and falls. So this issue about occupational disease isn't seen as a priority. It's not seen as a big problem. So if they are time constrained, they are going to focus on the things that the system seems to be focusing on and that their organization is focusing on and that their clients ask them about. Client knowledge, they felt, again, varied dramatically by the size and the sector. So again, a very large um, client, again, might have much more occupational health and safety professional resource than the HSA had versus other clients who basically, they felt, knew nothing. Um, so generally speaking, the view was that client's knowledge was generally low around occupational disease really interesting conversation about where do you get information about occupational disease. And the consultants talked about statistics. So kind of if you'd asked me information, I think, oh, well, you're going to tell me about the causes and kind of some details. But they saw it as statistics. And they had a very interesting kind of comment. So they said, well, we don't get a list of occupational diseases, which I kind of thought like a list of occupational diseases. So there were two things they were talking about. So first of all, the view was that the WSIB had a list of occupational disease. They didn't necessarily see it, but their view was that the WSIB had their own list. Secondly, the view was that the Ministry of Labor should have a list because under Section 52, employers are required to report occupational disease to the Ministry of Labor, but they didn't think the Ministry had a list. So as I say, it was this very interesting, as I say, I, was, I, I really was quite stunned by it. Um, there's this notion that somewhere there's a list that tells you what the occupational diseases are, and the WSIB probably has one, although we don't necessarily see it, and the ministry should have one, but we don't think they do. And because they weren't seeing the lists, that was again somehow kind of in reinforcing with them that occupational disease kind of wasn't as much of a problem because they didn't have this list. So that was, so that was kind of interesting to me. And they also, as I say, relied on their team members. So, you know, I now have to cover all of these sectors, and I don't know anything about construction, but, you know, oh, I, I think one of my team members did some work in construction, so they'll be able to help me out. So um, a lot of reliance on their team members and the few health and safety professionals that are in the HSAs. Clients' knowledge, again, variation by size and sector. Um, generally, they thought their knowledge was pretty low. 
Um, some of them felt that, the, that some of their clients barely understood the health and safety legislation and basic injury and safety issues, so like there was no chance in the world um, that they would really know much about occupational disease. The one thing they did note, though, is if the client had had a problem, so let's say they'd had a worker that had developed asthma, they then became very knowledgeable about that one very specific problem. So kind of there's this general lack of information and knowledge, but if they'd experienced a problem, they suddenly were became very uh, acquainted with it. So we took those um, results back to the workshop, and again, kind of the commentary was, well, there's so much to know. Like, we, we're supposed to know about all this, and it's just too much, and people priorize. And when they focus, they focus again on the high hazard issues, because that's what the system is focusing on. And um, the workshop also raised the issue about um, do we really have reliable and accessible sources of information. The other thing that was pointed out and was discussed much more fully in the workshop was the issue that for an injury you have your fall and you fracture your arm. There's really little question that that resulted from that workplace incident. But when you have asthma or you have dermatitis or you have hearing loss, you start to get into a conversation, oh, well, maybe the person had asthma before, or maybe, you know, they're just getting older and their hearing is getting worse. So there's, it's harder to sort out kind of the clear work-relatedness from, well, the person had this problem anyway. Um, so that's another of the challenge with diseases that, generally speaking, doesn't exist when you're talking about accidents. Uh, so any kind of comments around kind of that, that sense of knowledge? Anybody ever heard about the list before? <laughs> I Here? just want to say Section 12 of the Health and Safety Act, you can get statistics. You can request them as a union or as an employer of the Joint Committee. That might be a way for, like I know that for a, a sector, say MTO, yeah. we, pull it, we ask for Section 12 reports and we have the total of, of disease because there's actually noise-induced hearing loss yeah. in, that, in that sector. So there's, but. You know, that's a, again, that's a sectoral or a workplace way to get information. It doesn't provide a broad view. Yeah. The other comment I wanted to make is I can see this getting a lot worse with the current proposed policies that our WSIB is considering, where they're throwing the thin skull rule out the door and they're going to be, didn't they start at no now? So if it wasn't, if it was invisible before and difficult, if these new policies get in, uh, then age and pre existing conditions. Get it. So it's it's going to be even more. Uh, I have a few workers right now in emails in the last weeks about people that are sitting out, not being able to prove their conditions and not having uh, either comp or benefits. So. Yes. I just a quick question. You yeah. mentioned you know, the knowledge of the consultants. Yeah. There is a whole range of the levels yeah. of knowledge. What kind of backgrounds do they usually have? Um, so varied, um, and it varies a bit HSA by HSA. Um, so I would say range might be an individual who actually kind of worked in a trade um, and then kind of maybe did safety work in that trade and then was hired by an HSA um, versus an HSA um, hiring occupational hygienists. So a, a broad range, and as I say, I think there's a bit of variation across the HSAs. I think that would be fair, Irina and Janet. One of the things that was, so yes, there was variation, but one of the things that was interesting and a bit shocking for me being in the focus groups was that many of the folks that actually came out of the trades could actually talk about their own disease even though they weren't making the connect and were actually showing us some of their own <laughs> disease. <laughs> it was quite visible. So, or would talk about neurological problems they'd had when they were 29, when they were inhaling whatever. So the interesting thing was them not making the connect between their own experience to the reality. It was almost like that was something separate from what they were actually doing for a living now. And that, that link or that connection had to be made for them. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick comment for uh, factors such as workload for these consultants yeah. themselves and then dedicated training for them based on gap analysis that would continually enrich yeah. them without adding to their workload, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get, we'll get to that a bit more as we move along. 
just maybe one comment on the range of knowledge. It was, I'd say, probably more of the um, hands-on type consultant that came up through the ranks versus having a occupational hygienist on staff. Many of them were envious of those who had kind of the a resource. Yeah. That resource. Yeah. So we, we spent a lot of time talking about barriers and facilitators um, to awareness and prevention around occupational disease. We could spend a whole hour talking about those. So this is just a, a kind of a high-level summary. And again, they were, they were quite sophisticated in kind of these are barriers to myself as the consultant. These are barriers from the healthcare system's perspective. These are system barriers. Um, but this is just kind of summarizes some of the key ones. So lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, this issue about the system safe, focusing on safety, so OD is seen as low risk. And again, that's reinforced by, if you look at the WSIB statistics, as we did for dermatitis, 200 cases a year, kind of in the entire, you know, kind of in those sectors where, let's say, if we walk into a healthcare institution today, I could probably find 200 workers with disease. So a real problem that the statistics don't, um, again, tend to suggest that it's not a problem. Um, a lot of conversation around the lack of regulation, policy, and enforcement. And this, this generated actually some discussion and debate at the workshop. But the notion, um, so as some of you will know, Ontario still doesn't have a noise regulation. I think that's correct. You know, we've, the Act came in in what, 1987? No, 1977. 79, whatever. You know, and there was conversation about a noise regulation along with silica and asbestos and we still don't have a noise regulation. So the notion that if there were regulations that were focused on some of these things, that would help. Um, again, kind of a question about policy and equally enforcement. And again, so this gets into kind of the entire front line of the system. So if the ministry inspectors are out, and again, they're not focused on occupational disease, they again potentially aren't enforcing the act, generally speaking. Um, so as I say, that, so there was that kind of cluster of regulatory issues. The challenge of workplace culture is just part of the job. Oh, kind of, if you do this job, of course you'll be a bit deaf. Of course you'll have some problems with your skin. Um, the problem, again, that we've talked about, the disease develops often slowly. It's not like the accident where it's really clear. So, oh, well, the person, they, just, they have allergies anyway, or they're just getting older. Um, so hard to tease out concerns about costs of addressing occupational disease issues, and also issue fatigue. So, you know, kind of we're constantly, there are other new things we have to keep dealing with. And so like, oh my goodness, now we have to deal with kind of all these other things as well. So those were some of the key barriers, and as I say, we have a lot more detail around those. Facilitators, um, again, some interesting discussion. So going back to that regulatory policy component, um, the notion of blitzes and the importance of blitzes for raising awareness in the system of particular issues. So, you know, if the ministry would kind of, when they're, say, doing a blitz in healthcare, focus on asthma, or if they're doing a blitz in the services sector and they look at nail salons and whatever, and maybe they look at skin disease, um, they saw the blitz as being an effective way um, of kind of bringing attention and awareness. Um, they talked about experience, so legislative training, so we'll, we'll see later. But there was a lot of commentary around old certification <coughs> training, which used to be two or three weeks, and the fact that in that training there was occupational disease content. A certification training has shrunk in time. Um, there's less and less disease content, so that was clearly recognized. Experience rating, so again, um, I'm not an expert in the details of experience rating for occupational disease. I'm looking at Sheila and Emile, but I think some diseases are experience rated and some aren't. So if they're not, then again, it really doesn't kind of matter. And also um, making hazard identification um, a part of the WSIB clearance process. So a lot of thought from this group around kind of more regulatory policy ways. Um, also, interestingly, a lot of conversation about young workers. Young workers are very IT savvy, so can you use kind of technology as a way of getting information out? Um, the view that young workers seem to be much more willing to raise issues, ask questions, so um, maybe you target young workers as a way to kind of increase awareness and knowledge. The notion of campaigns, um, they use sun safety as the example. I'm looking at Des right here as we're about to start a, a project around sun safety. So 
can you hook it to a larger campaign that has both work and non-work kind of components so it can really be a societal level campaign. Um, a lot of, um, a bit of conversation around the increasing focus on wellness. So again, within organizations, um, a number of, again, larger organizations putting in wellness programs, um, which is not to say those aren't good, um, but it means they're also not focusing potentially on the hazards that are actually in the workplace. Um, and, but also the notion that if we did something around occupational disease, something would happen. So like if, if we stay committed to it and um, the system works on it, something will eventually happen. Um, so as I say, the workshop um, talked about a lot of these things, the need for multiple forms of information, um, an opportunity with workplace culture changing, so these are the young workers who seemingly are more empowered, um, they're a more, more educated workforce, at least in some sectors, and are maybe less susceptible to peer pressure as being opportunities. Um, the need for an OD champion, whether that's a person or a group in the system, but somebody has to be there kind of always championing occupational disease. Um, the importance of enforcement, um, the education of supervisors and managers, so this again goes back to training and, you know, could we please get occupational disease back into um, the mandatory training programs, the challenge yet again of our healthcare system and healthcare providers and the notion of a broad campaign. So then we had a conversation about resources. So we'll come back to some of the things we raised. So as I say, the consultants now that they're covering many sectors um, really rely on their colleagues and the specialists within their organization um, for expertise. The other interesting thing which I think the system has talked about and is a, is a real challenge in the system is information. And what we found, and I think it was pretty typical across kind of all of the groups was, because most of these, again, consultants have been in the system for a while. They're not like brand new in the last two months. They had their kind of treasure trove of information, the fact sheets that they really liked and used, and it was kind of tucked away in their bottom drawer. And it usually had come from their legacy HSA, so one of the 12. And they didn't necessarily trust information from other sources. So there were, there, there were these little treasure troves of information that they kind of valiantly hung on to because that was kind of their source of information. Um, they all acknowledged that, yes, there seemed to be resources more broadly within their organization and across the system. But they said, like, it's really hard to access. They're not indexed. So like, yeah, there's probably something out there, but I really don't know how to access it. And like when I want it, I want it now. I don't want to have to kind of, you know, work through multiple websites and whatever to try to get to it. Um, equally, if there's information out there, at times it's conflicting, and that's a challenge for them because which one do I, which one do I believe? And again, if it's going to come down to it, I'll believe the one from my legacy organization. And again, in the training that they actually receive, <coughs> it was interesting because. They talked about, again, I would say a kind of subtle shift in the training. So whereas previously they might have had, say, a session on occupational asthma, they said the training that they're receiving now tends to be more, how do I go out and effectively educate and do training sessions, or how do I go out and sell the products of the HSA to my clients, so the various training programs and that. So kind of a shift in training to how do I do various tasks as opposed to you're really going to kind of um, provide me with some kind of actual substantive content about a particular disease, say. Yep. Was there any discussion of the state of witness as a source of information for consultants yep. to engage with workplace? Yep. So w w the women's discussion was actually really interesting. So if they did kind of teaching or education with the clients around occupational disease. So let's say they were doing a certification training. Because there wasn't really seen to be a clear place for occupational disease, they said what they did was they used the WIMIS training as a way to insert a little bit of information around occupational disease. So it was interesting. Like, so we, you know, we don't have two hours devoted to occupational disease, so I'll try to slip a little in in the WIMIS section. Um, so it was interesting that that's actually how they used it. So they really used that as a technique um, to provide some information around occupational disease, but equally recognizing 
the problem with MSDSs, which kind of is a, is a, is kind of a significant part of women's training. And again, when you're talking about particularly allergens, um, kind of MSDSs don't contain everything that's in a product. So we talked about research. Um, as a research center, we'd obviously uh, kind of hope that they used research from our various groups. So they're, they're kind of answer, and again, this is, this is kind of the general sense. There were a few that were kind of very keen on research, but generally they said they really weren't that aware of research that was going on in the field, that it was hard to keep up with it. Again, they were really busy doing all their other activities, so they didn't have a lot of time to kind of go seeking. So they generally, they felt at least they weren't using research, or at least in the sense that I've gone and looked and found an article about. And again, it came back to time. I've got too much else to do, and I just don't have time to go and do that. They again came back to how do I actually get at it. So those of us that are kind of in a research center or a university can really, you know, you just go into your library and you can kind of access anything you want. Can't do that necessarily at an HSA. So they'd have to rely on their librarian to find information for them. Um, so again, rather than actually going and trying to find kind of research around the topic, they'd go back to their local expert. So it was a, a sobering thought for at least kind of some of us that, um, you know, although we kind of keep at kind of, you know, how can we make the research really available in that, um, it's still a challenge uh, for the front line. And just to reinforce, when they said local, when Len says local expert, they mean their colleague next door or their hygienist in their HSA. They're not thinking it was very, very internally oriented uh, how they support each other versus going out to get resources or, or advice from an expert. And the view was that, that you know, if, if it was a really challenging issue, maybe that hygienist or that ergonomist might kind of take that step of looking at the research, but it, it wasn't going to be them. Yeah. So from a perspective of their research needs, they kind of here were some of the kind of key features. They need to be able to access it quickly and easily. So like I don't have to go searching for an hour to find this thing. I can very quickly find it. Again, going back to that notion of trust in the source. Where is it like, you know, kind of who's produced it? So as I say, it's their legacy organization and their colleagues are the folks that they really and the things they really rely on as their sources of information. Another really important point that kind of came up throughout the discussion, but I'll highlight it here, is the issue of applicability. So, you know, it's nice you've gone off and done a research study, but I need to understand how I actually use it in this very practical situation in this very particular sector and workplace. So there's a real need for practical and sector specificity, so when they're out with a client. And again, I mean, I think, you know, that would come down to, well, you know, it's nice to tell me that you need to wear gloves for protection, but like, I need to know what brand. I need to be able to tell the person, like, when you go out to the drugstore, this is the brand you buy. And that's very different from us saying kind of, you know, kind of, well, you know, protective equipment's important and you should wear the appropriate type of glove. What they need is very specific information to the particular application. So this is their perception of the resource needs for their clients. So in other words, for the workplaces. So it's kind of the same, but it's also a bit different. So again, the notion that it needs to be by sector, it needs to be specific to the client's context. And their thought was that maybe you'd pick the five to ten top occupational diseases in that sector, and you'd give five things you need to know about that disease. So again, it gets back to that notion of you're not kind of overwhelming people with a huge amount of information, kind of what are the really key problems in this particular sector and context, and what are the few key things I need to know about it. So that was kind of one thing. They also talked about the need for anecdotes and stories. You know, kind of, well, it's nice to have the fact sheet, but still, for a lot of people, what will really capture them and interest them is if you have the story of a worker who has exposure to this particular chemical and develops asthma, because then they can actually see themselves in the story. So again, as we're thinking about putting resources together, I mean, I'm thinking of, of the new uh, disability kind of center and the stories on the website. So the importance of those stories of the individuals that are affected. Um, format, fact sheets, tools, short, free downloads, simple terms, lots of pictures, and assessment tools. 
So I think pretty kind of not surprising. They also said, though, that underneath that, they still liked the resource document. So although to take to the client, they wanted kind of the one pager that was really clear and simple, they might still like to be able to go and find the five pager or the 10 pager that really explained things in more detail. So kind of a, a kind of graded set of, of materials from really simple and clear to kind of a more detailed and nuanced um, set of information. And then it'd be really nice to have all of these things so kind of I could go to the toolbox notion and kind of pick the pieces that I needed for this particular setting. So we took that back to the workshop and again kind of there, were, there was affirmation of that but, but they also took things a bit further and one of the really interesting things that came out of the workshop that I don't think was really talked that much at the actual focus groups. I'm looking at Irene and Janet to kind of confirm it was the notion that maybe for the frontline consultants in the HSAs, they should actually have some core competencies defined and then have training around those, which is a kind of interesting idea. Um, the, the linking about how to actually apply the information, the central repository that we trust, the notion of a broader campaign, People, particularly at the workshop, although a few people in the in the focus groups talked about the old Oshko OD working group, and there'll be a few of you around the table that remember the times of Oshko and there was an OD working group. Um, we actually met for a few years and you know worked on some things, and there was a, a certain nostalgic fondness for that group, and kind of something <laughs> like that was seen to be something that would be kind of nice to have to move some of this forward. And again, the notion of like don't start building everything from scratch. If the resource is already out there, use them. Don't kind of reinvent the wheel. So like we don't need four HSAs to now start to develop a set of fact sheets on whatever. Like let's see what's there, sort out what we have and what we need to add. So I'm just going to flip through a few slides. We're actually going to do our at work pre-insert this time on this study. So you'll actually have, a, you'll have some kind of narrative to read as well. Um, and just tell you in the just before we round up. So what we're going to do from this is um, the notion of the toolbox, which the ministries used around MSDs. So actually thinking about what do we need to put together to provide this set of resources. And again, this isn't the notion that anybody specifically owns the toolbox. It's really saying there it's a collection of resources that the system needs, and how can we think about kind of what those might be figure out which ones already exist and which ones do we need to develop. So the principles they say are locate and validate existing resources, both around research, research and practice. And we're going to focus on skin disease as the place to start. So as I say, let's not reinvent the wheel. The health and safety executive has some marvelous resources. Um, so like if they've got it, we don't need to create another poster on how you take gloves on and put, the, you know, put them on and take them off. It's already there. We need to build on existing local and international resources. There's an incredible campaign in Germany around skin health. You know, we don't need to reinvent how you put a campaign together. They've already done it with great success. Refine resources to reflect current best practices for delivery, considering accessibility, the use of kind of new technologies, electronic technologies, and learning considerations of visuals, language issues, and build trust in the information kind of working locally um, where those that are interested can be involved in kind of sorting out what we need and help produce them so they feel some ownership, some confidence in them, um, allow those to be customized as needed and personalized if needed. So kind of you develop kind of the generic piece that you can then customize for a particular sector or even a particular workplace. Can I just maybe add on to what Lynn just said because there has been a lot of discussion about how best to create the toolbox and um, there could have been an approach that would be kind of a top-down or a centralized approach where it, we would just pull together, do an inventory of everything that's out there and put it through some sort of filter and decide what should be in the toolbox. But we got a lot of advice that that wouldn't build trust in the system. We might end up with a lovely toolbox, but it probably wouldn't get used. There was also discussion about recreating the OSHCO subgroup, so to create a group of people from across the system and have that group work on it. But even, even that, the feeling was that given the state of the health and safety system or the health and safety organizations, uh, 
having a cross-cutting team to actually do the work uh, also wouldn't uh, necessarily create a product that everyone would trust and use. Um, so I'll let you carry on then. How, no. So we're actually doing it in a more of a decentralized way, but creating process where it can come, come back to the center for review, but we're actually building on the areas of interest and strength that actually exist in different HSAs or different parts of the system. So it's a bit more complicated, uh, but the view is that it will be more likely to be used. So one of the projects we've been working on for a few years is the development of some awareness posters around skin disease. And we started that work with um, Workplace Safety and Prevention Services and started actually with um, vehicle sales and service as the very specific focus. And we developed some posters. We took them out, first of all, to um, two conferences actually and tested um, kind of some of the messaging. We then developed a set of seven posters which we put into actual vehicle sales and service uh, workplaces and got worker feedback around the posters, modified the posters, put them back in again. And we've now recently taken that set of posters and are getting feedback from our patients. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting piece because it's one thing to have it out in a workplace where they don't really think there's having a, have a problem. It's really interesting to get feedback on the posters from the people that actually have the disease. And there's a little bit of difference. We haven't kind of finished the analysis, but there's a bit of difference in their reaction to the posters and what they really like and what they're not so keen about. Um, so posters are a thing, but again, you know, we started with an HSA, but we've been approached by a community health center that has a particular issue around a particular sector, which are nail salons. So we're actually now going to work with that CHC around posters very focused on nail salons and the problems. And again, um, there, it's an immigrant group by and large, so we're going to look at some of the translation questions. So the notion of kind of taking this, but then how do you customize it? How do you work with different groups to make it fit their needs? Um, there are obviously fact sheets, and I think one of the key things that needs to be done, and I think the ministry's knowledge group is inventorying what's out there, because the reality is there's a lot of material that's out there. And say, rather than us writing another set of fact sheets, if they already exist, we should just use them. We're starting to have some conversations with PSHSA around some e-learning activities. Um, and then, as I say, there's also this interest, although you need kind of some of these more simple tools to use in the workplace, you still need that kind of deeper level of kind of well-synthesized resource material. And so we're also thinking about that. So that just gives a sense of kind of some of the things which, uh, as we've listened to, um, the, as I say, the frontline consultants in the HSAs and kind of what they think the needs, their needs are and the needs of the system, so how we're trying to address that. So, uh, Irina, Janet, any kind of final comments, thoughts? We should, great. Thank you, Lynn, because we should probably... Uh,